Hi. Can I ask you to grab some breakfast and take a seat where we're ready to begin today's very special program? I'd like to welcome you to the first of the 2011 Aspen Institute Book Talks in New York. I'm Linda Lara, Director of New York Programs. And on behalf of the Institute and the Business and Society Program, I'm very pleased to be welcoming back an author whose interesting and thoughtful writing has made him an Aspen favorite. Para Khanna is a leading geostrategist and world traveler, in addition to being a best-selling author. Since we last hosted him in 2008 for a discussion of his book, The Second World, Parag was picked as one of Esquire's most influential people of the 21st century and one of the 15 individuals featured in Wire Magazine's Smart List. He currently directs the Global Initiative at the New America Foundation. So uh, this is the book we're going to be discussing today, and there are copies of it for sale back there. Um, if you look at some of the reviews for Parag's book, um, the one he'll be talking about today, How to Run the World, Charting a, co a Course to the Next Renaissance, you'll see the word provocative mentioned again and again. Could the reviewers possibly be referring to the assertion he makes in the first few pages that, quote, there is one way to run the world with diplomacy? Or perhaps the statement that, quote, 21st century diplomacy is coming to resemble that of the Middle Ages? Or maybe it's his comparison of the current worldwide no holds barred contest for power and legitimacy between regimes, companies, NGOs, religious groups, and superpowered individuals all pursuing their own interests to a mosh pit. My personal favorite, however, is Parag's description of diplomacy as, quote, the world's second oldest profession, but one that comes as natural to human beings as the first. So, um, with those thought-provoking statements I've shared with you, and uh, let me reveal right now, they all occur in the first nine pages of the book, I'm sure that we're in for a very illuminating and provocative discussion. So let me now introduce you to Parag Khanna, who will talk a bit about his book. Parag? Good morning. Thanks to everyone for coming out on this um, on this chilly, chilly, frigid day. And uh, thank you, Linda, for having me here again. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is a very uh, erudite and experienced audience who's, who's so familiar with the topics that I write about. So I know that I can really just jump right in. But I'll do so by way of picking up where, where I left off when we were last in this room together, which is uh, the, the topic of my last book, The Second World, for which I spent a substantial amount of time in the Middle East, particularly in Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan, Syria, and so forth. And and I will, to take just exactly a three-word quote from what I wrote about Egypt, uh, this was based on my travels there in 2006 and 2007, I said, this country is ripe for revolution, uh, because in any such environment where you have such a high degree of political alienation and economic disenfranchisement, high unemployment among youth, and an authoritarian regime with one foot in the grave with no succession plan, I think you can do the math. And so all I did was go there and call it as I saw it. And, and I did that for, for, for about 45 other countries in, in, in that book. And, and I mean, I haven't been wrong so far, at least in terms of what's gone right and what's gone wrong in some of these places. But the Arab world, what's happening there, was, was staring us in the face for a very long time. But our diplomacy, which is the subject of this book, really wasn't attuned to those kind to, to, to either predict or, or handle those kinds of shifts. And in the media today you're reading about the, the hand wringing and the critiques that, that our um, that our State Department intelligence agencies have about their lack of foresight and, and, and responsiveness to this. The fundamental weakness though isn't so much that did you predict it or did you not predict it? Because of course, you know, you can't be blamed for for not knowing exactly when a financial crisis is going to happen or a civil war or whatever the case may be. But you can be faulted for not having the right set of scenarios in your head and having mapped them out. After all, quite frankly, what, what are the thousands of people who work for the US government, whether it's the CIA or State Department and so forth, and desk officers, what are they doing if not thinking through the scenarios? And if that's not part of their job, it, it should be and it should have been a long time ago. So to not 
be aware of and to not have, well, there's two things. One is to not be aware of the possibilities of these things happening and what and how they might unfold, because that is something that you can constantly game out. Um, the second is then to not have um, anticipated, and by way of anticipating some of these scenarios, to build and shape and, and, and change your diplomacy accordingly. So let me give you a very concrete example. In several countries, uh, such as Pakistan or Egypt, uh, we've done a very poor job of reaching out to some of the uh, marginalized parties, the Muslim Brotherhood, various opposition groups, youth movements, and so forth. A very, very poor job of actually reaching out to them and saying, you know, uh, we want to have relations with you. You are not the government, but we will deal with you in a public diplomacy kind of way, try and understand your interests and concerns, and build those connections and relationships. Because if you're pushing for democracy in a given country, then you have to be prepared to not know exactly who's going to win. And maybe it will be the Muslim Brotherhood. Maybe it will be someone else. And if you're not, if you have no relations with them, they owe you nothing. If you're not friends with them, they owe you nothing. Our job in diplomacy is not simply to be friendly with the, the government. It's to be friendly with anyone who might be in government. Uh, that way, you always maintain strong ties and can have some kind of continuity. We failed to do that in quite a few situations, and it's something that greatly disappoints me. The deeper message there, again, is about how we conduct diplomacy, because if you think of diplomacy as only state-to-state -state relations, what, our, what Hillary Clinton does when she travels abroad and shakes hands with various heads of state and gives speeches and so forth, that's not the sum total of diplomacy. That's only one third of what diplomacy is. There are three kinds of diplomacy. I, I think it's very difficult to quantify this one third, one third, one third, but I mean one third in terms of one out of three categories. The second third, the other, another one of the major categories is public-private relations, which is a lot of what I, I talk about and in fact celebrate in many ways in this book. Those are the relationships that form between governments and companies, uh, governments and NGOs, and that kind of thing. And that's very widespread. Uh, I think anyone in this room would be hard pressed to identify a single area of global management, global problem solving, whatever the case may be, that doesn't now in one way, shape, or form involve uh, companies, NGOs, religious groups, civic actors, and so forth. It's very much embedded in the process. Naturally, one thinks of immediately the, the Gates Foundation or our energy companies uh, and their operations around the world. And the, yes, it, because it, it isn't just some peripheral phenomenon. That is, in fact, a core part of what diplomacy has become, uh, particularly when it does come to defense, uh, energy, uh, finance, and so forth. These are all, uh, particularly finance, the result of globalization. These, these aren't genies that are going to put back in the bottle. These are not things that uh, the state has allowed and the state can rein back in. Globalization has become greater than the state. It isn't anything that any one state can control. And so to me, I elevate these, these actors, uh, uh, whether they are <coughs> private or civic and so forth, and consider many of them, not all of them, but some of them, uh, uh, able to act with a certain amount of authority. And this is the, the key uh, sort of insight here. Diplomacy is not about sovereignty. As, as, as the joke uh, that Linda cited goes, diplomacy is the second oldest profession. It long predates the modern nation state, and therefore it long predates modern international law and the codes of sovereignty. Diplomacy is not about sovereignty at all. Diplomacy is about authority. Diplomacy has always taken place among some, anyone who's someone, someone who has resources, an actor that has loyalty, that has recognition, that is mutually recognized by others, that commands a certain uh, attention, and that can be a religious group, that can be an NGO, that can be a company based on its financial resources, it can be any number of things, it can be authorities. And we have many kinds of authorities, and the state is one kind of authority. Now, the state is not dying. Many states are dying, and in fact, a big chunk of this book is about the post-colonial world and the states that are dying. But there's not a, this is not an either-or process. Diplomacy is additive. The more authorities you have, the more diplomacy you have. So I wanted to reconstruct diplomacy from, from the bottom up. So you have public-private, public-public diplomacy, public-private diplomacy, and then private-private diplomacy. And this is so often ignored. But all of you who work, any of you who work for multinational corporations and go abroad and negotiate mergers and acquisitions and also go and, and negotiate with local authorities and so forth, you are, in fact, engaging in diplomacy directly from your firm to, to a, a foreign counterpart. That is diplomacy. That is negotiation. And that is something that transcends the boundaries uh, of the state, even as it may function within certain legal codes. So there are three kinds of diplomacy. And if you cling to a Westphalian notion or, an, or a state-based version, you're not really getting the full picture. 
So what I try and do in this book is lay out that landscape of these three kinds of diplomacy, but not in a, in a theoretical way, really much more in a functional way, because I believe that when we talk about how to solve the world's problems, the, the biggest mistake is to gravitate towards uh, one institution as an answer rather than towards a method. Because that is what crisis management says. Crisis management says, we've got a problem, let's convene the G20. Well, what if the G20 is not the right place to solve that problem? Then you're not necessarily going to get the right solution. Bad process leads to bad outcome. Diplomacy is a process, it is a, it is a toolkit. And what you do is, you think when you have a problem, let's take climate change, uh, you don't necessarily say, let's have a summit in Bali, or Copenhagen, or Cancun, or the next city that's going to host a summit where lots of emissions will be burned when, when, when uh, dignitaries fly there, and no agreement will be reached in, in the vain pursuit of universal binding international legal restrictions on emissions. That's not going to happen. Instead, if you want to reduce emissions and you think about your diplomatic toolkit, you would say, how do we get more clean tech innovation coming out of companies in various parts of the world? How do we subsidize the cost of the transfer of those to industrializing countries? Therefore, we can reduce those, co those countries will be able to absorb the cost of reducing their emissions. That involves companies and innovators, it involves conservation groups, it involves uh, um, uh, 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 mayors at a city level, it involves factory owners, it involves all sorts of people beyond just uh, heads of state and, and uh, governmental negotiators who get together at summits. It's a lot more complicated to think about diplomacy in this way, but it is a lot more accurate, uh, a much more accurate description of the world. And so this book is kind of takes a jackhammer to the idea that you can simply say, let's reform the United Nations and then we'll have better global governance. Let's expand the Security Council from 15 to 25 countries, and then it'll be all better. Let's put more issues on the G20 agenda, and then you know, the world will be run more efficiently. None of those silver bullet solutions ever works. They never will. None of them take into account just how much globalization has diffused power and how difficult it will be for some kind of um, ideal type state-centric multilateral order such as the post-1945 moment will to ever be re resurrected again. So this book is not necessarily optimistic or pessimistic, uh, but I, I do think that it's a realistic account of, um, of, of the real challenges and the realities of, uh, of, of globalization and what it's done to the world today. So I will um, pause at that point and allow us to engage in a conversation about uh, all of these things, uh, not least the Middle East, which we can certainly come back to. Thank you very much. We've got a journalist on deadline here. Um, I would like to introduce that journalist, uh, Matt Bishop, who will be the questioner and moderator for today's program. Um, Matt is the U.S. business editor and New York bureau chief for The Economist. Um, he's also a frequent uh, figure around the Aspen Institute, having participated in a number of panels and moderated a number of them as well. His <coughs> most recent book, The Road from Rune, How to Renew Capitalism and Put America Back on Top, was published last year. So I'd like to introduce Matt and uh, let the conversation begin. Good morning. Um, yeah, as, as, as I was just said, I've just filed a story, so I managed to finish it 10 seconds before I came up here. So, that's, uh, you've seen The Economist in action. Um, Barack, the, I mean, I wanted to start with what's happening in, in the Middle East at the moment, which you, you, you began by talking about. Um, I mean, what are, what are the implications for, um, for, you know, for, for, all, for all of us as, as to how we um, play the diplomacy of of this extraordinary change that's going on there. I mean, obviously Obama's getting a lot of criticism for did he blow it or not. Now Ferguson was saying and so forth. I mean, how does your book uh, chart us a different path out of here? Well, you know, first of all, if you'll notice with uh, the diplomacy around what's happening in the region, it's been either very quiet or non-existent, depending on the country. Uh, no doubt, initially, you know, we sent certain signals to Mubarak, and we have sent signals uh, to some of the governments, such as Bahrain, uh, to be uh, much less heavy-handed in the streets. That really hasn't had much of an, an impact, and I think that tells you how quickly events are moving, how limited our uh, our leverage is in that part of the world. Certainly in Libya, it's non-existent. Um, so I think it's it's case by case in terms of those countries. But even, again, looking at, at Egypt and, and Bahrain, countries that are allies, allies of the United States, how little leverage we have over those situations is, is remarkable because 
partially, uh, if it, it really hinges on whether we are for or against uh, the man on the street. And we have long underestimated uh, people power, uh, even though we have been, uh, in, in many cases, part of spurring it. If you think about Ukraine and Serbia and other countries, the United States has actually played, played a very important role in those revolutions. And so it shouldn't, in fact, surprise us at all that the young people, and we have, in fact, covertly <coughs> played an important role in what's happening right now. I guess we were just, you know, it's a left-hand, right-hand situation. Uh, I, know, I know several individuals in the US government who have spent quite a bit of time in Tunisia and other countries actually working with youth, youth groups and getting them wired up with social media to help spread that message around the region and the tactics and techniques and you've seen some of this republished in the New York Times in terms of the, the manual uh, that, uh, that some of the protesters are using. Uh, you know, there are elements of the United States that, that, are, that are part of that, which I, I think is a great thing. Uh, and yet some of that has caught us off guard and certainly, certainly our, our diplomats. Now, now moving forward, it's important to remember that each of these countries is actually quite different. It's, it's very common to make the 1989 analogy, but there there was a common external yoke uh, of the Soviet Union and the regime types through the Warsaw Pact were relatively similar. In the Middle East, actually, you have uh, quite a diversity of regimes, whether they are uh, tin pot dictators or uh, constitutional monarchies or whatever the case may be. Uh, they're, they're quite different and they will go in different religion, uh, dif different directions, um, and we're going to have to watch. Each will unfold under a different uh, time horizon. Um, so I think that we are going to have to develop very tailored strategies. It's not just going to be, well, our new policy towards the Middle East is to always support the people and we'll never have, uh, you know, you're my SOB sort of policy ever again. That's not really true. We will cling to quite a few more SOBs, both in the Middle East and around the world. And in other countries, we will do the right, we'll do the right thing, quote unquote, and, uh, and abandon them. It's going to be a strategic calculation. There's nothing wrong with making those realpolitik types of, of calculations, but we should know or be able to see the writing on the wall with some places and not fight uh, the wave too much because you risk burning your ties uh, with the people who are eventually going to come into power. Look at, um, you know, Saif al-Qaddafi had a chance with his speech uh, two days ago to uh, say, you know, I, I'm going to work with my father and try and get his head straight. Uh, instead, he was basically mimicking uh, and, and aping his father. And now he's completely burned his chances. And when they get the father, they're going to want to get the son too, based on what he said. Bad move, I would say. Um, you know, the, the generational change factor is not something that you can so easily ignore. Um, so I think that we need to be just much more deft in, in, in who we negotiate negotiate with, how, and, and as I said in, in my talks, uh, you know, be sure to be friends with all sides because you never know who's, you, you certainly don't know how any one of these uh, situations is going to, is going to end up uh, one month from now, one year from now, or even maybe two to three years from now. Um, I mean, the implication of your title, you know, is that there is a way to run the world, and I guess, um, you know, maybe the implication is it's America, America can still run the world. Um, and yet, I think an alternative interpretation of your book would be that you're sort of reporting on the sort of growing impotence of, of a superpower to actually run the world at all, and that what we're left with is much more likely to be chaos. It's the State Department begging Twitter not to overhaul right. its, uh, its server at the weekend rather than actually going in and, and sorting a problem out. I mean, are you actually feeling that there is a way that we can get a meaningful strategy to work in this new multi-partner world? Sure, absolutely. You know, this is definitely, I, I'm, I'm, I, I guess from my last book, you know, sort of people know that I'm not, I'm the last person who would ever say that America is going to run the world ever again, because uh, I've been painted as a declinist um, fairly, you know, in, in, inaccurately. I mean, relative decline is a material fact that I think I, I, I laid out pretty well uh, in the last book. But so this is not an argument that America can run the world. This is an argument that better diplomacy, irrespective of who is part of it, <coughs> can, can do a better job of managing world affairs. And that, that, that's the argument that I try and sustain here. But in terms of America, um, I, I do believe that America uh, you know, is and can remain the most influential society in the world. And I think that that's a different question. And the manner of that influence is, is what I try and describe here um, as, as a more globalized foreign policy that reaches beyond just the institutions of government in Washington towards looking at America more broadly. Because the, the, imp the imprint, the footprint of America, meaning the 300 million of us, uh, is far greater than that of the U.S. government, far greater than that of the Defense Department and the State Department and other agencies uh, put together. 
It is, again, our private sector that is a major capital exporter around the world and a creator of jobs and a, a booster of economies and so forth. We help create rules for economies all over the world. That is, that is one major way in which America impacts the world uh, that is not governmental. Another is, of course, our civil society, I mean, our universities, of course, that are world leaders and educate the world's leaders and have, have expanded abroad and have campuses everywhere, not least in the Middle East itself, amazingly. Um, another is, again, our, our, uh, the, the fact that our open immigration system makes us the largest source of remittances in the world, the volume of remittances that flow from the United States to other countries, from Mexico, Philippines, India, is far larger than the volume of foreign aid that we give. Our migration policy is a form of development policy. Uh, and then there's, of course, the generosity of American society. Uh, per capita, per capita basis, Americans are the most generous uh, individual charitable contributors uh, in the entire world. There are many ways, therefore, many, many, and I've only covered just a fraction of them in which America has a tremendous impact around the world. And it is that transcends Washington, it transcends the government. What I urge, and I spell this out very concretely in the book, um, what I urge policymakers in Washington to do is first of all to get their whole of government approach or interagency process. For anyone who spends time in, in Washington, these are already just cliches that make your eyes roll because they can't seem to get that right, but it would be nice if they would. That would be just step one though. Step two is the term you just used, the multi-partner approach, which is actually getting a better sense of the landscape of what other countries are doing in XYZ geography. So when it comes to North Africa, those North African countries are virtual economic colonies, actually, of, of the European Union. Whatever intervention we may make there is, is not likely to be as substantial as what European countries are already doing. So where in the dialogue in our media is, it's, it's always sort of, what are we going to do about it? Well, let's talk more about what we should be getting the Europeans to do or what we can do together. But that's not something that immediately pops to mind in our US-centric kind of framework. And the third is the American society approach, the public-private approach, uh, which is leverage the things that American uh, players are doing around the world and take that into account in your policy, especially since the US government, given our fiscal position, is not really going to be tripling the number of foreign service officers or tripling the volume of foreign aid, and even if it did, how efficiently would it be spent anyway? Uh, so I really think that, that we need to have a whole of society approach in our foreign policy, and, and, and I strongly urge policymakers, uh, both in this book and in all of my conversations, <laughs> with them to, to, to think and set up a diplomatic process in this way. Now, reading the book, I was struck by constantly thinking about how does your analysis relate to two of the most, sort of what I see as the most difficult issues on the global agenda at the moment, one being the, the rise of Iran as a potential nuclear power, the other being uh, our seeming inability to do anything about climate change. And I, you know, I take your points early on that you know, we can invest in new technology in the private sector and so forth, but it, it does seem to me that some you know, global treaty is going to be required at some point, and there's no sign of that happening, and I can't see a process by which it's going to happen. I mean, how, do you, how do you look at those two issues? Well, let's take, let's take the climate one again first, because, I mean, it's fine. This is, I never make arguments against the state, against government, and for markets and for civil society. The p entire purpose of this book is to break down those barriers and talk about the interactions and coalitions that form across them in a world in which we have to think about everyone having certain responsibilities and not just some inherently governmental responsibilities, those responsibilities often not met. So I, I don't accept you know, any, any kind of strong uh, barriers between them. So I'm not opposed to universal binding legal uh, caps on emissions. Go for it, please. Have 10 more summits and try and get there. But in the absence of doing that, or in the absence of success in that, and even if you did have it, you would still need to do all of the other things that I, that I lay out in this book and that many uh, climate experts and technology experts and, 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 and scientists have uh, proposed that we have to do, that, that deal with innovation, that deal with market-based mechanisms for transfer, that deal with uh, other kinds of uh, sub-state regulatory vehicles and investments, things that American individual American states have done with their utilities, like in Florida and Nevada and so forth. All of that activity that percolates from the bottom up and sideways would still have to take place for us to so actually do something about climate change as opposed to talking about it and creating a, a treaty around it. So I, I, I'm not an either or type of person. It's both and. 
on, on the climate issue. And on Iran, this is actually very, very simple, quite frankly, because we have had three decades of sanctions uh, against the country. We've tried to isolate a country that is so geographically central and a neighbor to so many and so important uh, for their energy supply and economic growth. There's very little loyalty to uh, the American-driven sanctions regime. As, as, much, as much as it might hurt uh, the Iranian government, it also strengthens it in a number of ways, as we know, because it allows them to take advantage of sanctions and colonize uh, the economy which they have very much done. And also we know that Turkey, Brazil, uh, China, and others are really boosting their economic relations with Iran. And uh, at this point, no one in this room or anywhere can say with any certainty that our approach, uh, righteous as it may seem, is actually going to win out. Now, I, I'm trained in political geography, so I really find it quite bizarre that we would attempt to physically isolate a country that has this incredibly central geography and attempt to uh, promote pipeline routes that circumvent an energy-rich country. Uh, and pipelines are a, are a multi-generational investment. The, the pipeline map of the world would look really silly circumventing Iran rather than realizing that one, one point or the other, and you might as well do it sooner rather than later and not waste so much money, you're going to have to go through it and with it and leverage those resources. To me, we should be using energy as a form of diplomacy with Iran as a carrot. Um, as the Europeans most certainly want to do. And if you do that, and if you allow uh, a, 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 um, a modernization of their infrastructure, you could wind up doing things that we haven't done so far, which is actually empower an independent private sector in the country. You could start to have more of a uh, more Western presence in the country, which could have an impact on, uh, on, on certain uh, new centers of power and so forth. And you could really shift the dyna dynamic from within, which is not something we're achieving right now, not something that we have uh, had any success in doing in the last three decades. So sitting it out, which is what sanctions basically means, uh, doesn't really, you know, gain you a whole lot of influence there. I think that, you know, our lifetime of experience watching this situation is a testament to that. And yet still we, we have, we kind of have our, our head in the cloud. So I would say go full throttle, normalize relations, uh, penetrate, infiltrate, uh, you know, all of us should get on the next plane and go be tourists there. And that will start to shake things up a little bit, uh, at least a lot more than what we've done so far. But I do, uh, in all seriousness, in terms of focusing on the energy, I think it's very important because I'll give you and I'll, I'll end with this, a very concrete example. Our Iran policy clashes directly with our Pakistan policy. Our Pakistan policy, and th that, that's no um, small statement given this length of the border that those countries uh, share. Uh, our Pakistan policy is supposed to be about supporting uh, access to energy and uh, simulating the economy of a very uh, uh, economically and, and energy poor uh, country of 180 million people, and that's Pakistan. Our Iran policy is to isolate that country and to prohibit it from exporting any sort of oil and gas. Now, that's a direct contradiction. You have to make a decision there. Right now we're making no decision. We're opposing. But if you wanted to help the people of Pakistan, there's nothing better that you could do than allowing cheap natural gas uh, to flow from one to the other. We're not doing that. We have a, this is a serious dilemma that adds on to all of the contradictions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and problems with our Iran policy. But I mean, raising the example of Pakistan, I mean, you know, you, you are highlighting the difficulty. I mean, that whatever, whatever one does, it seems doomed in some ways to not work. I mean, and, and I wonder you know, if we did adopt a policy in Iran of, um, you know, working with them on their energy front, do you not end up with Saudi Arabia type relations, which, you know, could backfire against America quite badly if we got the sort of uprising in Saudi Arabia that we that we've seen in uh, some other parts of the Middle East. Well, I mean, you know, I think we have to be very obviously humble in the face of current events and realize just how difficult it is to predict what's going to happen. I'm simply saying that uh, the, uh, a freeze in relations or the lack of engagement or sanctions policy alone has proven time after time to be an insufficient vehicle to changing either foreign policy or regime type or whatever the case may be. So with that in mind, given that that has really become something of, a, of, an, of an axiom in international relations because it, we have, it has proven to fail time and time again, I do think that we should go to the opposite extreme and, and kick off an experiment and see what, uh, what, what we can do better. So that on that, on, on Pakistan, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of short-term thinking about what, why it is that countries like Pakistan or Sudan or Congo or, or Egypt or other places uh, are facing the situation that they are. And we have tended to think of failed states or failing states as some phenomenon that just uh, cropped up after the end of the Cold War. The bipolar uh, yoke was lifted, uh, you know, no, you know um, 
no more support for certain regimes, and so they started to fall apart because we weren't propping them up. That's a very, very narrow, short-term uh, U.S. And, and Soviet foreign policy-driven understanding of what causes state failure. I believe, and, and I explain this in, in this book, that the state failure that we see in 50 or 60 countries around the world is a, is a multi-generational process that began the very day that most of these countries became independent in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Because from that point forward, uh, they have had uh, largely, by generalizing, uh, had very corrupt uh, governments, yes, some often backed by us or, or, or the other side. Uh, they have had, had no investment in public infrastructure, uh, a waning sense of national ideology, huge overpopulation. The populations of an, any number of these countries, such as Pakistan, have tripled in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And therefore, there's no coherence, no competence, no capability, no capacity to govern what they are today. And, 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 and no sense that the regimes that, that are there right now can actually handle it. That's, why, that's what a failing state is. It's something that has been, been really unfolding across the post-colonial world for 50 or 60 years. It's not just because we pulled the plug out from Mobutu or someone else. This is a much, much longer, deeper process that, again, I don't think is going to be so easily reversed by saying, hey, let's go and state build. That's not going to happen. It's not going to work. The, these, these countries do not have the capacity, they do not have the institutions to govern the size populations and the demands that their societies face today. It will not happen without a completely new way of thinking about governance altogether. That is a much different role uh, for corporations, NGOs, and other types of, of players in society. You mentioned uh, the NGOs and uh, uh, business and so forth. Um, and this is an area I've obviously written about in philanthropic capitalism, where you know I'm sort of sketching out this whole new partnership approach that um, you know the likes of Bill Gates and business can have in, in helping to solve some of these big social problems. The criticism that I've found thrown back at, uh, at the vision that I articulate in that book, and um, which you also articulate, um, is that I mean, essentially a world in which Bill Gates and Facebook and Walmart are our most constructive uh, problem solvers is a real step backwards. Um, people really don't like you know, the fact that billionaires are increasingly going to be shaping our policy agenda and so forth. And it feels like a failure. Um, their interests are different from our interests and so forth. I mean, how, how do you relate to See, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy any of that because, as you know, I support your, your thesis greatly and, and, I, and I echo it uh, very strongly in this book because, I, uh, as Linda mentioned, I, I call it a free-for-all. It really is a free-for-all. And, and I'll give you um, one example of this that isn't really about NGOs per se, but it's about China and Africa. You know, for the last several years, a lot of people in Washington, Paris, and London have been denouncing China and Africa. Oh, my God, China is going to Africa. It's the new colonialism. It's like, no, it's not. First of all, China has been asked in many ways to do this. They've cut deals. These are sovereign governments negotiating. This isn't 18th century European colonialism. Uh, second of all, they're investing in infrastructure. That's what these countries need more than anything else in the world. Uh, if you want to help an African country, you need to be investing in their infrastructure. And we could have done that in the last decades, but we've been skittish about it, you know, and we haven't gone about it right. And third of all, it's not the, a new colonialism because this is the 21st century where the whole world is watching everything they do. Uh, Zambian political parties couldn't declare that they would, you know, recognize Taiwan if China didn't create more jobs uh, back when, uh, when, when French and British colonizers were going in. So this is a very different landscape, and China is actually learning uh, very quickly. Uh, as, as quickly as they can because they, they fear blowback. Blowback was also not something that European colonizers worried about. So, you know, we're, it's a sort of a normative uh, free-for-all out there where really if you're going in and doing something and, and you're allowed to do it, um, you know, that, that, that the, the diplomacy of the deed really, really wins out. And the Gates Foundation is, is a good example of this because they're not, they don't have an army. They are, they are invited in. They, they go, they, this is public-private diplomacy. They go and they negotiate, uh, and governments welcome them in to do what they're doing. There are, there are, there are uh, unintended consequences of that that, has been, that have been widely reported, such as the skewing of, uh, of workers in the health sector uh, towards projects that are run by Gates and so forth. But there's a huge misunderstanding because it, it doesn't have to be either or, and this is, this is where I think um, you know, I, I support what you've said and, and bring it up here. Uh, at least 70 to 80% of the Gates Foundation money goes to public-private partnerships. It's not, this is Gates money, we're hiring Gates people, we're a health uh, you know, colonization force going in and running our own thing. 
They do more to support public health infrastructure than most foreign aid groups do. Full stop. Most of their money goes to public-private partnerships, not towards running their own parallel health infrastructure that is meant to displace the government. And it's so the, the fact is that whether it's an NGO or a company, uh, such as an energy company that is uh, building schools and hospitals either to improve its PR or because it needs a well-trained workforce that isn't dying of various diseases, uh, one way or the other, whoever is providing that infrastructure is providing some quote-unquote public good. And to me, it uh, matters much less who does it than that it get done. And what may happen through that process is that you'll start to have a competition among models. I mean, how long do we want to live in a world where very stale foreign aid agencies that recycle money back into various contractors and with a, with a, with a very poor track record of huge, of, of significant change on the ground are the one and only model we have? We are experiencing, we are in a time of very serious and I think very positive competition among models, whether it's macroeconomic management models, state capitalism, hybrid models, or laissez-faire capitalism. We have competition in every sphere, in every arena, and that's a good thing. That's how change that's how change happens. That's how you move beyond a world in which you think of just, let's take it to the United Nations and strengthen the United Nations, and you embrace the fact that the 21st century is not like 1945, and that you need new mechanisms that bring in uh, the private sector NGOs. That's why new UN bodies like the Global Compact or UN AIDS and others have NGOs on their boards and companies on their boards, because they've realized that they have to actually be integrated. I mean, hearing you speak there, you sound quite idealistic, and uh, elsewhere you've been yeah, much quoted talking about how in many ways we've gone back to the Middle Ages or we're going back to the Middle Ages, which is not a period that I feel particularly is a, a great, great period for idealists. I mean, there were obviously moments of great creativity, but also a lot of misery and wars and so forth. I mean, how do you, how do you feel more optimistic about this sort of world view that you sketch out than, say, you might have felt at the birth of the United Nations in, back in the uh, 1945? Again, I mean, it's, it is a very different world. The, the medieval analogy, I think, is very useful because that was a multipolar world. China, India, the Arab Islamic world were among, were, were the most powerful uh, civilizations and empires of the time. Think about the, the caliphates a thousand years ago and the Song Dynasty, Song Dynasty China. Uh, it was obviously in the Western world, uh, the Byzantine, Holy Roman empires that were, that were weak and defensive and so forth. So for us, obviously, the Middle Ages seems like a very pessimistic analogy to make, but it was a multipolar world. It was also when globalization 1.0 took place, really. I mean, the first intercontinental or transcontinental trading system that linked uh, the principalities and city-states of Western Europe with China, the Silk Roads that Marco Polo traversed, this was uh, in the in 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. So to me, again, that is a useful analogy because we are, we are, we are entering this phase of global connectedness and, and that was the first time that happened. We are in, obviously, it's the Middle Ages on steroids in terms of the degree of technology and speed of movement of capital and, and people and so forth. But the interesting thing is, and, and the reason why, uh, you know, to, to me it's important to bring up the Renaissance because the Middle Ages ultimately culminated in, in the Renaissance in the West, and, and it didn't uh, culminate in, in a world war, or some cataclysmic world war, because the other, I mean, the other favored analogy, or the more favored analogy that I dispute uh, in this book is, is that we are in, in a period that's like the interwar years or the late 19th century, uh, because that also was a multipolar but European world. The, the, this latter scenario ended in World War I and the former in World War II. That's, that's quite pessimistic, actually. So to argue that we could be heading towards a renaissance because of the, um, uh, the power of globalization and the ways in which it, it, it enables uh, the autonomous self-representation and empowerment of different kinds of communities, to me, is actually something that is uh, relatively hopeful. Right, well, I could ask lots of questions about that, but I'm going to throw it open to the, the audience now. So, gentlemen in the middle and then over there. Yes, um, thank you for your <coughs> remarks, uh, which were very interesting. I was wondering, during your three-part categorization, uh, entities like international criminal courts or peacekeeping missions default, they're not states, they're not NGOs, they're not private sector actors. How do they 
Well, I mean, international agencies and, and, and uh, intergovernmental agencies uh, or treaty-based uh, groups like, like the ICC or Peacekeeping Forces of DPKO uh, are, are state-based, treaty-based uh, organizations, so I treat them uh, as such. And, and I talk about both in, in my own way. When I talk about the United Nations, for example, in this book, I say that we shouldn't really uh, treat it as an all-or-nothing phenomenon. And most Americans, by... by, by uh, by the fact that they tend to be very ignorant about the UN system, treat it as an all or nothing thing. It's either with us or against us, right? Did the Security Council support our resolution? No, well, damn them. And did they agree? Well, great, let's, let's reconnect with the UN. And even in our presidential debates and so forth, it's really all or nothing. We have to go back to the UN or not go back to the UN. The UN you know, is comprised of, of literally hundreds of individual agencies and the Department of Peacekeeping Operations is one of them, a very important one given the share of the budget of the UN that it consumes. And it has, there are over 100,000 UN peacekeepers uh, operating in various missions around the world. The ICC is also very important. I, I celebrate the functional agencies of the UN in this book, uh, UNICEF, the World Food Program, UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, because they do something. They actually do something. Uh, they save lives. They deliver welfare. They do things uh, more cheaply and better uh, than we would do them. At very little cost, uh, they, they, they do, do a tremendous amount of good. They deserve those Nobel Prizes uh, that they win. Uh, other bodies I'm not so sure about. I'm really not so sure about the Security Council. I would every, every moment of our mental effort and uh, every, every uh, decision that is made there, I believe, should be devolved to a regional organization. Uh, I don't believe that people in Africa should have to wait for a uh, UN peacekeeping force or operation to be approved based on parochial Russian and Chinese concerns and potential vetoes. Uh, for, 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 for Africans to solve African problems. We should be supporting the African Union. The United States actually does do that, in fact. Uh, over a billion dollars worth of support to the African Union, which has actually helped make it uh, an ever more confident uh, uh, regional organization. So, um, you know, I have a strong critique of some parts of the UN, but strongly support uh, others. But they play a role. The ICC plays a role in this book because um, I'm surprised, actually, you didn't mention this, Linda, because I talk about um, uh, revisiting our policy that, that bans, uh, that prohibits the assassinations of foreign leaders. <laughs> and I come out in favor of thinking about targeted assassinations in cases where the ICC has indicted a sitting head of state, such as Omar Bashir of Sudan and other cases. Uh, and in cases where I add further qualifications so that I don't look like some kind of reckless uh, assassin. Um, <laughs> But other qualifications include having some sense of what type of regime might come next. So, for example, in Zimbabwe, you actually have uh, you know, an educated society, you have government structure, you have political parties, a lot of people marginalized, a lot of tyranny. But if Mugabe were removed one way or the other, Zimbabwe would resurrect itself and, and function, right? I'm, uh, Sudan, you could probably say the same thing. I'm not so sure about other cases, such as right now, if you took out Gaddafi, you know, one doesn't really know what, what order might come, or North Korea. Uh, but where the ICC has uh, indicted a head of state, uh, I, I think that maybe we can, we can revisit that policy. I mean, I just, want, just before we go to other questions, I, my sense was that the decision to prosecute Bashir and it, uh, caused huge disruption amongst the NGOs that were working in Sudan to deal with some of the problems on the ground. And you know, I, I talked to the head of one very large uh, international NGO that regarded that decision to go after Bashir as one of the most catastrophic decisions the international community could have taken. Now, if you throw a price on the guy's head as well, I mean, it, I mean, you really are you know, going to aren't you going to a world where you're making it harder for the the bad guys, to, so to speak, to come to the table and actually be reformed, and you're forcing it into a more violent. And so he entrenched himself, and he and he ousted a lot of civil society groups that were active in the country because he considered them Western agents. So that was uh, certainly an unintended consequence of that policy. But the purpose of the policy should not have been to indict him and then just, you know, pretend like it never happened and then just have a status quo, because that makes ICC decisions seem rather toothless. You actually have to do something about them. And that's why the purpose of such an indictment, or even the whole responsibility to protect doctrine, uh, is intended to actually uh, generate the legal conditions which compel action, that don't just indict someone, that don't just say, there's a genocide going on, we're supposed to do something. You're actually supposed to do something. So it's unfortunate to me, actually, that that indictment was, was toothless, and that's why those unintended consequences were allowed to take root. But are you, are you sort of advocating mercenary armies going after some sort of, I guess you'd call it an X prize, if you say. <laughs> <laughs> X prize against whatever. dictators. I mean, is, is that what you're advocating? I bet there is a, a, a you know, 
there's a Mo Ibrahim like person who's not as gentle as Mo Ibrahim. Uh, Mo Ibrahim is a gentleman I write about in this book, the Sudanese entrepreneur who created uh, the Ibrahim Index for Good Governance in Africa, and he talks about all of the the criteria he would like to see for for good governance, and and he doesn't even em emphasize democracy as much in that, which is interesting. But he also is always willing to offer a, a blank check or a certain amount of a cash prize to a, a sitting African dictator who will voluntarily leave office. Um, and I think it's actually a good example. Those incentives tend not to work with people like um, uh, like like Bashir. But by the way, on you know, I do I do talk about these mercenary armies. It's a very medieval phenomenon, of course, uh, that that do run rampant around the world. Not least because the, many of them are headquartered in the United States and are contractors to the United States, and have now been become contractors to many other governments, to wealthy families, to corporations, and so forth. This is not a phenomenon that we'll be able to put back in the box. And both the UN, DPKO, um, even in the Security Council, many NGOs have considered or already do use them. Uh, for their own protection uh, or to support their, their operations. So um, I'm not going to make a verdict on whether or not we need to hire Blackwater to assassinate Omar Bashir, but I, I am going to say that we're, we're not re that even if the U.S. were to, um, were to sort of get its act together and to heavily regulate this industry and, and try and put it back in the box here in our country, it would probably not slow its growth everywhere else in the world. Okay, I'll lady here. Right. So are you still talking about a world that is state-based, or are you talking about parallel? No, I'm talking about the independent republic of the supply chain. And that, that I think, is a point that, that I make so much in, the, in this book that, uh, that people have, have cast me as going overboard and, and having abandoned the sort of state order. I don't believe there is a state order. I believe power and authority are situational and contextual. And for anyone who's been outside the United States to most of the world, I think you, would, you have no choice but to really agree that that's exactly how it works. Who is in charge really depends on where you are. And it could very well be the supply chain. It could very well be Walmart that, that many people around the world want because it creates jobs um, and, and good jobs. Where you may not want it to move in next door to you in Pennsylvania, uh, but if you are in an African country, you certainly do want uh, Walmart to be there. So uh, that, that, is, that is the world that I see in most of the world, because it's so simple to say, with the, the bailout of Wall Street, it's the return of the state. Well, which state? We are one state. And yes, China is powerful, and Brazil is powerful, and India is getting itself together. That's four or five countries. We live in a world of 200 countries, and not all of them uh, have, that, have that state capacity. In fact, and what, what passes for the strength of the state is very often based on the role of uh, corporations and the ability of corporations to harness their resources. There's a famous saying by um, uh, Ulrich Beck, a sociologist. He says, um, he says that the only thing worse than being uh, overrun by multinationals is it not being overrun by multinationals. Because uh, the truth is that, that, that the, the private sector and the role that it plays in, uh, in economic growth and job creation so forth is really fundamental to making states uh, in any way, in any, in any meaningful sense, uh, strong. So I don't, I don't view, and, and, but I wouldn't use the term parallel universe, though, because it isn't. It is the same world, in fact, where, again, power is very sort of uh, contextual. long-term uh, impact of the internet on world affairs. Um, in particular, um, comment on my hypothesis that the internet is destroying globalism. Um, to uh, expand on your uh, analogy here, in, in fact, the Renaissance, uh, the Italian Renaissance, 15th century Renaissance, as you know, is a result of the cutting of the Silk Road uh, and piles of skulls uh, in seminary uh, and the loss of, of Constantinople. So, is globalism, uh, in fact, uh, going to be destroyed by the internet? Well, globalism, depending on how you define it, but globalism... Um, I'm defining it as an idea that started in the radio age with the uh, League of Nations, right. it expanded to the television age with the United Nations, and then it's been expanded with all those institutions since then. Yeah. 
those are now obsolete. The internet makes them obsolete, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, we still have all of those functionalities or, or technologies, and technology is additive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily do away with, with radio. The BBC World Service is still listened to by a great many more people than, have, than I imagine have internet access. Uh, so I think these things are all happening at the same time. But the concept of globalism is, of course, relatively new. It's certainly a 20th century invention. I mean, the idea that we have global connectivity, a, a, a common, or we live in a global community of fate, which is a term that um, academic whom I've worked with is a sort of coin. This, this global collective consciousness that many people uh, take to be natural and many younger people certainly feel uh, a loyalty to today that, that didn't exist as much in previous generations. Um, it is there. That doesn't mean that it, it's real. Uh, it's, it's real for those who believe in it and it's not real uh, for others. And the internet is something that has helped make it possible both for people, some people, to believe in it and for some people to act on it because it creates connectivity. The more connectivity you have around the world transnationally, the more you can feel this globalism. But I don't believe it. I don't hold it to be a universal phenomenon. I hold it to be something that many people are working towards, uh, whether they will get there, whether they will succeed, whether everyone will feel this globalism really depends on whether or not uh, that, that is carried forth and implemented or, or not. It's a struggle. It's maybe an aspiration. But it isn't somehow uh, a reality. Uh, I think, again, it's, it's, it's a goal that many people have, and I'm not opposed to that goal at all. But do you not think that, to some extent, the medium is the message here, that you know, Facebookism is much better than Coca-Colaism, really, as a, as a sort of worldview? If you, if you are seeing Facebook as your, as your sort of revolutionary tool, that, I mean, that's buying into a set of ideas about the world that's actually far more globalized than... See, I think the, the real question is identity. Right. At, at root, when people, when most people talk about identity today, they just assume you mean your nationality or your citizenship. That's not necessarily the case anymore. What globalization, meaning uh, the, the spread of, of capitalism, technology, and so forth, connectedness, what it enables is for people to define a different kinds of identity or multiple types of identity. You've always been able to say, actually, my identity is my religious one, right? I'm Hindu, or I'm Muslim, or I'm whatever. Or it's your nationality, but you can also have multiple nationalities. You can have multiple identities in that way. Many people who belong to the independent republic of the supply chain uh, actually believe they have a corporate identity. I meet young people in business schools all the time who come from other countries uh, and whose, uh, b whose education is being paid for by a corporation, but uh, come from a country whose passport is a very limited utility when it comes to traveling. Not everyone gets a travel visa free in most places like Americans. I meet Russians all the time who work for Goldman Sachs or other places who say, I'm really, I belong to Goldman Sachs because if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be able to get a visa to go to XYZ place. That applies to Chinese, Indians, lots of people. You know, most of the people in the world don't get to travel so freely. If it weren't for corporations that help support their transnationalism and movements, you know, they wouldn't be able to do that. So it's a, their corporate, their employer is a big part of their identity. Then there's Facebook. I belong to this community, this cl a cloud community or various cloud communities in which I have membership through social networking and so forth. And you can even have a generational identity. I'm Generation Y. I believe strongly in Generation Y and its uh, potential you know, for a common ethos, uh, whether it is uh, uh, about ecology or something else. So there, I think there are many kinds of identity you can have, and technology helps you to explore and define uh, and, and join forces with others who share your identity. Uh, again, it's neither good nor bad, but it certainly is. Right at the back in the middle. I'm Tom McCormick, the CEO of Save the Children. I'd like to ask about the interface between state diplomacy and the kind of uh, multi sectoral, multi actor diplomacy you describe in your book. Um, and in that latter, certainly, occasionally we live in a 365 days out of the year working with companies and universities and media and uh, technology and so on and so forth. But we also find ourselves dialoguing with ambassadors foreign ministers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the interfaces, it seems to me, remain very sticky or difficult. Um, because, number one, the, the domains are not clear any longer. Who, who has what authorities for what? But also the professional preparations, the, the diplomats, the schools they go to, and so on and so forth, give them this interstate framework, by and large. And then there's the framework you describe. So my question is whether. You, you do feel like we've got a, a problem of uh, 
of a kind of a transition between state diplomacy, um, mass, mass <laughs> engagement, mm -hmm. and if so, how it can be included upon? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. It's a very real phenomenon that, that you face. Uh, I think that in the past, whereas um, uh, an, an, a humanitarian, an American humanitarian NGO might have said, well, you know, we have limited amounts of funds. We always have to go to USAID or other government agencies to raise those funds. Now it's like, well, we'll go to the World Economic Forum or the Clinton Global Initiative or any other uh, set of actors and we'll raise money that way. And we can get money more quickly from, from private actors or from foreign governments or whatever the case may be. So there's an amazing opening up of this space, but there is definitely there are definitely psychological and therefore bureaucratic barriers that exist between old school diplomacy and sort of new school uh, diplomacy, and, and the, the tension really continues. When 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 I'm speaking to a room full of diplomats, uh, you can only imagine how many hands go up and say, you know, your thesis is preposterous. Uh, everyone knows that diplomacy is only done among states. I say, well, you live in your narrow world, and you can continue to do that, and you you'll probably die with it. But, but I don't say that, but but um, <laughs> but. You know, th there's many people who can't even conceptually en envision this world in which we're transitioning towards, and it is a long transition. It's a multi-generational transition. But you know, it, it's very hard again to imagine the world becoming less complex uh, rather than more, and and there being less. Uh, you know, substantial a number of uh, non-governmental actors or multinational corporations. Remember, as as global globalization hasn't even really been global. We're already sick of the term. And yet only 20, 25 countries have dominated world trade, right? And not everyone has had a mobile phone or, what, or whatever technology. We're now entering the phase where hundreds of countries have ever higher trade to GDP ratios and where globalization has become inter-regional. Uh, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, uh, the Far East, India, and so forth, getting involved in trading with each other outside of, the, of a Western-mediated, Western-regulated type of system. And they do that diplomacy as well with their corporations, with their NGOs, and so forth, moving all over the place. So we're, we've only really just begun to see what total globalization might look like and, and feel like. And uh, I think it's going to get ever, ever messier and involve those kinds of very fluid dynamics such as what you experience every day. Sometimes you're negotiating and fundraising from a company. Sometimes you're negotiating access with the government. Sometimes you're forming partnerships with, your other, with other NGOs on the ground. That's very postmodern. I call that postmodern diplomacy in which you actually are, are um, conducting multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral relations constantly. That's a very appropriate, uh, your, your, your life, what you are doing really is an embodiment of, of what is really becoming the norm for everyone. It's become the norm for governments to have to negotiate with companies. It's become the norm uh, for NGOs to negotiate with companies and so forth. Uh, and I think that's something that we have to come, come to grips with. There's a lady next to you. Well, I mean, you're describing a particular kind of, of non-state group, um, you know, a, a political, an armed political faction. It's not a party uh, as such in a democratic context, but it is, it is a, a movement, uh, most certainly. And um, we negotiate with them because that's exactly what we are, in fact, doing, as my colleague Steve Cole has just reported in, in this week's uh, New Yorker. Um, and actually have been doing for quite some time. When, when actors hold territory, well, Colombia has to negotiate with the FARC and had to negotiate with the FARC. They also went in militarily and managed to regain ground. But you negotiate with, um, you know, everyone that has, again, that is a recognized authority or that, that, that by virtue of the resources or population or, or military assets that it commands is an authority of some kind. You may not like it but it is an authority in the, in the very academic sense of the term. So we negotiated with it, and that's exactly what we're doing, and we have to do that. And we should have started to do it, quite frankly, a very long time ago. Okay, um, over on the right then. Uh, I'd like to explore a little more your comments on how we dealt with Egypt and Bahrain. Uh, the observations you made about Egypt in 2006, one could have made, did make, one did make the same observation in 2000, 1996, those criteria saying for 30 years that Saudi Arabia is not sustainable. But they are allies, and we have a pattern where we do support certain dictatorships and non democracies. And we've had a good working relationship with Egypt. Bahrain is the base of our fifth fleet. So, to take your point that we should at the same time, while supporting these dictatorships, 
but they are allies and they meet our foreign uh, policy goals. At the same time, the State Department people running around talking with uh, organizing student groups, which would undermine the government that's our allies, wouldn't really be sustainable either. So we make that comment that what we felt we should have done, but I'm not sure I'm questioning how realistic that is. While we have strong relationships with an ally who's well, what we can increasingly do is be something of a facilitator or a mediator. I mean, towards the tail end of the Musharraf regime, we were involved in facilitating, uh, or we were at least present at his dialogues, or urged him to conduct the dialogues with Benazir Bhutto and the PPP. And those took place in the UAE and other locations. So we can be in a country and say, we're urging you to patch up these things because otherwise you face a political crisis. Uh, the same thing can be done in places like Egypt, where we can say, you know, it would be a good idea, it would behoove you to uh, legalize the Muslim Brotherhood to be uh, a legal uh, political party because that way you will channel their energies into the democratic process rather than uh, through through social and religious networks and so forth. So these are things we can encourage. We can encourage uh, constitutional reform. I mean, the fact is that we have supported, it's not just that we support dictators, it's that we've supported ex strong executive forms of presidential republicanism. That, that enable and really uh, give rise to or, or allow the, the, the hardening or entrenchment of dictatorships. Why aren't we for pushing more for parliamentary style democracy? Right, which allows for political parties and other types of uh, political institutions, independent judiciary and so forth to form. A lot more emphasis can be done on that. If you help to steer uh, such regimes towards more progressive kind of governance, then it's probably in their best interest because then maybe they would survive and not be in the kinds of situations that they're in right now. But I mean, you know, the choice is between a short-term view and a long-term view. You know, they serve us for X amount of time, but what happens if when the regime collapses and you are viewed as being, uh, having really back to the hilt, the dictator, then again, the people who then take over owe you nothing. In fact, they'll think of you as an enemy. This is why in Uzbekistan, after the Andijan massacre in 2005, when we withdrew support and, and uh, financial and, and military and so forth from the Uzbek government, uh, the Uzbek people were actually quite grateful. And then China swept in, and Russia came in and wrote checks of one or two billion dollars uh, to keep uh, Karimov uh, in, in power. Uh, but now the Uzbek people know that you know if they ever get him, in which they will eventually, and they topple him in whatever way and hang him in the street, whatever they do, the, the enemy to them, the geopolitical enemy, isn't going to be America. They're not going to blame us for having backed their dictator. They're going to blame China. They're going to blame Russia. Unfortunately, we have actually crept back into bed with him a little bit. Uh, which is which is unfortunate because the border, country border is Afghanistan. Um, but again, you know, if you think longer term about these things, we could be more engaged rather than. I think we're just very complacent. We assume that Mubarak will be there forever, and you know, he'll pass power to his son, and it'll be okay, and the people will be okay with it. They don't know better, whatever. These kinds of complacent uh, mentalities really need to go because the world, people of the world have more information and more resources and more ability to speak for themselves than ever before uh, from, from the bottom up. So we have to be aware of that. And if we can be seen as urging reform, even if we're not succeeding in it, because I really take your point, that even if we really did say to Mubarak over the last 30 years, wouldn't it be great if you appointed a vice president? Wouldn't it be great if you, transit, if you strengthened the, the, the cabinet and the prime minister a little bit or you know, allowed for uh, free and fair elections? We did on some of these things. We didn't on others. But at least if we're seen to be urging these things, I think we'd be in a better position right now. We have not even been, been seen to be doing these things. Well, I, okay, very briefly. I mean, but to the extent we're seen to do it, that means we're doing it very publicly, which would not uh, be a way to develop a strong relationship with the ruler. We could continue to do it. Well, I mean, there's a mix of public and private. It really depends on the context. I, I don't. I certainly don't believe that everything does need to be done in in the spotlight. I do talk a lot about naming and shaming in this book, but there are contexts where it works and contexts where it doesn't. But signaling, messaging. I mean, this is very situationally specific stuff. You can't give a universal answer. I think people uh, in this room probably know that when it comes to China, uh, public shame is not going to earn, score you a lot of points. Uh, you know, just take the example of Google or others. If you come into a public standoff with them, it's they're very likely to remember uh, the episode very badly and to seek retribution against you 100 years from now uh, but then still remember it. Whereas private diplomacy with China, very quiet diplomacy on a variety of issues has proven to be uh, 
to be quite successful, talking to them quietly about their Africa policy, talking to them quietly about, uh, uh, about labor rights and other sorts of issues has actually proven, and they welcome in those uh, people who they view as improving them, strengthening them, making them a better society, a uh, better run. I take the example in this book of Business for Social Responsibility, an NGO that used to have just a hand small handful of people in China. It has like 45 full-time people now in China at the request of the Chinese government. An American-based NGO is welcome in China because it really helps to improve conditions in, in the workplace and other kinds of things and works and consults with Chinese state-owned and, and other companies uh, to help improve the conditions uh, in their factories and so forth. So there, that, that's a very quiet way of going about changing something. Uh, so I think sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. Unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time, but I'd just like to finish with one question to you, which is, you know, if you had just one piece of advice for President Obama, Secretary Clinton, as they handle this extraordinary moment in the Middle East, what, what would that one piece of advice be? I would, I would, uh, I think I alluded to this earlier, uh, but work way more with the Europeans. I mean, this is the, this is this Mediterranean Union concept that Sarkozy has talked about much more rhetorically, you know, to score political points than anything else, is actually a real economic domain. And the only way you're going to really deal with the problems in the region is through, um, you know, cleaning up the economic management of those countries, investing in education, jobs, all of these kinds of things. The vast majority of exports, particularly natural resources from North Africa, actually go to Europe. Europe should very much be in the lead here. Um, and so we need to actually be pushing them rather than intervening ourselves. Uh, we really need to think much more about the longer term vision for that region. And the Mediterranean Union is a very good vision. It's one that we should support. But it, that, that, that therefore means it's the one in which Europe is in the lead, not us. Great. Well, Parag, thank you very much. And it's great to have you. I'd like to thank both Matt and Prague for a very interesting and provocative morning. And I would like to let you know that um, our next book talk is scheduled for March 16th. Am I right, Garrett? Um, and we will have UCLA law professor Lynn Stout talking about her new book, Cultivating Conscience, How Good Laws Make Good People. And she'll be in uh, conversation with Floyd Norris, who's the chief financial reporter of the New York Times. So you'll be hearing from us shortly about that. Thank you for coming. And um, Parag's book is in the back, and he'll stick around a little to sign it, right? Yeah. And thank you again. Thank you.